In this video, we're going to talk about what the devil knows, and we're going to discuss the topic of whether or not the devil has any wisdom. In the word, we see that the devil is prowling around looking for someone to devour. And the way that he does that is by knowing what issues he established with you. What are your strongholds? What are your weak points? He's trying to gain a kingdom for himself by stealing God's people, God's creations. And indeed, he's going to steal the majority of God's creations. But that isn't happening outside of the sovereignty of God. And in counterfeit Christianity, they act like this is happening. There are certain things that happen outside of God's sovereignty. Nothing happens outside of God's sovereignty. If God wanted to preordain everyone to be saved, then he could have done that. But what God did is he chose a remnant of people who, whom he would give a heart after his own, whom he would give a heart to love him and know him. He chose a small remnant and the majority of people who will exist on this earth, have existed on this earth, will not be saved. Many are called, few are chosen. And Paul tells us that he established this, which group we were going to go into. He established who was going to be an object of his mercy and who was going to be an object of his wrath in order to display to the objects of his mercy his glory through the objects of his wrath. Because he wants the objects of his mercy to know what they've been given and to know who he is. How many times does he say in the word, then you will know that I am God. I'm going to do all this. Then you will know that I am God, that everything is mine, that none of these other gods could have foretold any of the things that he will do. So we see in the book of Job that he is that he, the devil, is roaming the earth and he's looking for someone to he's going to and fro, looking for someone to devour, as Paul said. And that God says, have you considered my servant Job? Why would God do that? Like, is he setting Job up? Well, at the very end of the book of Job, we see that God says to Job, who is this who obscures my plans with words without knowledge? So we are to understand that it's not as though God is making a deal with the devil or something. He has plans that he is enacting. He has something that he was revealing in this process with Job. And remember that Job had multiplied his words against God over and over. And that when Job finally heard from God, he said, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Now my eyes have seen. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The devil does not have power, but that which you give him when you choose him by choosing self, by choosing the flesh, by not turning to God. That old thing that we used to see on cartoons, you know, the devil on one shoulder and God on the other, is probably more accurate than anything that you are seeing in counterfeit Christianity. Except that this is not like some battle between God and Satan. That's not where the battle is occurring. The battle is occurring in the flesh. And so this is why I say that this is more accurate than anything you're learning in counterfeit Christianity. Because you got one on one shoulder and you got the other on the other shoulder, and you're in between, and it's you. Your battle is happening in you, not outside of you. It's happening in your flesh, your physical flesh. Your mind and body want the things of the sinful flesh. And so you're told to discipline your physical flesh, your mind and body, and you're told to circumcise from the sinful flesh, and you're told that God is spirit and that he's in your heart, when he makes you a new creation, he removes your heart of stone. He gives you a heart of flesh. He places his spirit in your heart. And then he begins to move you to follow his laws and keep his decrees. He is spirit. So he communicates with your spirit and he's cleaning you up in your heart. That's where you're going to be judged as to whether you belong to God or whether you belong to Satan. What has gone on in your heart? Has God known you? Have you been interacting with him? Have you been having a relationship with him in your heart? That's where you will either be justified or you will be condemned. This is why I tell you, you need to pay attention to what is coming out of your right hand, your forehead, and your mouth. What's coming out of your behaviors, your thoughts and beliefs, and the things that you speak or the way that you speak. And if, those, if there's any discrepancy between what you're speaking, lip service, and your behaviors and your beliefs and what you think, if there's a discrepancy there, you better go back to your heart and go see what's going on. If God keeps having to deal with you on sin, you better go back to your heart and figure out what's going on. So does the devil have wisdom? Does he have understanding? Did God say to the devil, 
Well, here's my plan. No, he didn't. He said, have you considered my servant Job? And God had a plan when he said that. He wasn't just making a deal with the devil and he wasn't setting Job up. He had a plan. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He had a plan to test Job and also to reveal his glory through Job. What the devil has is that he knows God's law and he has observation. And this is what he has established in the world because the devil only has carnality to work with. It's not as though he's ever going to be made a new creation. It's not as though God has entered his heart and consults with him or gives him wisdom. It's not as though God ministers the word to Satan by his Holy Spirit. And indeed, no one can have wisdom unless God gives it, right? That's what the word says. So no, the devil does not have wisdom. What he has is that he knows God's law and he has observation. Now think about what's been established in the world because he's the prince of the world. What is his gospel here? His gospel is science, right? And how does science operate? Science operates through research. And what are the rules of science? The rules are only that which is observable, measurable, is true. That's it. That's all they're going to work with, that which is carnal. We who are in Christ, we have, who have understanding and wisdom, our hope is in what? Things unseen. But those who are children of the devil, their hope is in what is seen. Those who are of this world, their hope, their knowledge, their foolish wisdom of the world is in what is seen, what is observed, what is measurable. Now you can take a look at something that is measurable and you can take those results back up to God and say, okay, what do they mean? Or you can go make your own story about it. And that is the difference between wisdom and foolishness. That is the difference between truth and falsehood that's found in science. Science is not just observation. What makes science evil is the authority on which they speak. They speak on the authority of the wisdom of man, on the authority of carnality, on the authority of the important people of the world. That is what makes science wicked because anybody can observe a child can observe you can have a child can go out and do an experiment and observe the results it's what you do with that do you bring it to god do you understand based on his truth and his word or do you have something else some other authority on which you speak even those who call themselves christian do this all the time. They have another authority on which they speak and then they call it God and say, oh, God gave us science. Really? God gave you a field that denies him? I don't think so, guys. God gave you a field that speaks on their own postulations, deviating from the word? No, I don't think so. This is what the devil has. He observes and he tries to deduce. What does it mean? The Bible is written in such a way that God tells us what will happen but he only reveals how it's going to happen to those who love him. He only reveals when or as it's happening to those who love him. You can't understand the word with your carnality. So these principles in action, let's just take a look at them for a minute. Many of us came out of counterfeit Christianity, if not all of us, came out of counterfeit Christianity. We saw certain passages in the word or we heard certain passages in the word. We heard them over and over for many, many years, maybe our whole life. We heard them, such as praying in the name of Jesus, and we had a certain idea of what that meant. And then we come to understand, oh, wait a minute, the rest of the Bible talks about whatever you pray in my name, you'll receive. So why isn't this working? How come, I, you know, how come when I'm screaming Jesus' name over everything, it's not working? Something must be wrong in my understanding. And if we pursue truth and we go to God, then we start to realize that God made a name for himself and that anything that we pray, we will receive. But also, James tells us, you're not receiving because you're praying with your own motives. Oh, well, maybe this name means something different from a word or a proper noun. The name of God is his cause, his reputation, what he's doing. And it just so happens that the one place in scripture where God says, this is the name, this is the name you are to call me for all generations from here on out. I am. And it's translated to the word Hayah. The verb 
haya, not the proper noun, the verb. I was, I am, I'm being revealed. That's what haya means, not just I am. Well, now, if we go around screaming the name Haya, what is that going to do for us? Anything? What he was telling us is that he was, he is, he is to come. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. He is continuing to be revealed, and this is the name. This is the cause. This is the reason. This is the will. And that just so happens to be what James told us. If you learn to pray in the will of God, to rend your heart to what he wants, of course you're going to receive whatever it is you ask in his name, in his will. If you understand that, it is going to totally change the way that you pray. It's going to totally change your posture, what you feel inside, and how you rend yourself into wanting what God wants. Totally different understanding, isn't it? And as I think of counterfeit Christianity and how many times I hear people say, in the name of Jesus, and they're screaming this out and they're screaming at God, screaming orders at him and following it up with in the name of Jesus. You know what it reminds me of? The pagans who were slashing themselves in Elijah's time, screaming out to God, slashing themselves, doing all of this foolishness. And Elijah was standing there saying, call out louder. Maybe he can't hear. You know what I mean? This is paganism. This is not Christianity, please. How are you going to yell at your sovereign God to do these things and muster up that so-called power in your flesh and think that God is going to be like, oh, okay, this time he yelled loud enough. This time he said it with enough authority. Stupidity, you guys. Come on. No wonder pagans look at counterfeit Christianity and think they're stupid. Because they are. That is so stupid. Why in the world would anyone think that God responds to that? That's like a complete lack of understanding of his heart. It is not loving truth. This is what happens when people are reading the word with their carnality rather than pursuing the heart of God. So the devil doesn't have any understanding. God doesn't minister his word to him. And indeed, no matter what the devil knows, God is always using it, and he has every ability to blind the devil and to drag him along, like he says, drag him along like a, like a little bird. Show him to the women, oh, look at my little bird on a string. Put a hook in his jaw and drag him here and there. He has every ability to blind him and prevent him from understanding what he doesn't want him to understand. Whatever God allows the devil to be privy to, he's always using so if you're going through something, you always need to remember to turn to God. The devil does not have power and he does not have knowledge. Now, here's one of the other strategies that the devil will use. He will poke around and he will poke around at the chinks in your armor. Things that he has known that you have had because you let him know. Unresolved suffering, lukewarm, unoccupied. Those are the three chinks in the armor that God has me talking about. Places where you have not fully submitted yourself to God, where you're still playing around with the world. If you are unoccupied by God because you have not returned to him and you do not remain in him. And unresolved because everything that God has sent, he is intended to build, build you. So if you don't resolve your suffering with him, you will continue to remain open and vulnerable to the devil. You're not having PTSD attacks. The devil is attacking you. You are not having flashbacks. God is giving you an opportunity to resolve the issues that have happened in your life. And if you keep spurning him and acting like those are a nuisance to you and you don't perceive that God's calling you to resolve and to heal and to bring it to him, then you will continue to have that chink in your armor and the devil will poke around and he will see what's still there and what's not. The enemy can also see certain things that you're doing. So I was talking with someone yesterday who was telling me that they were having a really difficult time being able to carve out time to work in the workbook and that things have kind of come up. Every time she's getting ready to sit down with that book, something comes up. That is not uncommon. The devil does not want you doing this work. But the thing that you need to know is that he doesn't have any power to stop you from doing the work. You do it anyway. And indeed, there are times where God will show me certain things like he will show me that the devil is not wanting me to do a particular thing 
or that there's some breakthrough that's about to happen because the, the devil's up in the ante, or he's bringing some sort of warfare or something like that, and God will use that in order to show me this is really important to him because you're about to be free of this, or this is really important to him because it's really important to me, or keep holding on because you see the devil is freaking out right now. His anxiety's going through the roof. There are certain things that the devil can understand. In Revelation 12, you see that there are two things that triumph over the devil. And what that means is that he loses his place in heaven. He loses his place in the heavenly realms. Those two things are, number one, the blood of the lamb, and number two, the testimony of the witnesses. And so when Jesus was here and John the Baptist was preaching, repent, make straight paths for the Lord, he was preaching about the Messiah. He was letting him know the Messiah is coming. And Jesus said to the disciples that in, since the days of John the Baptist until now, heaven has been exposed to violence and the violent people have been raiding it. What does that mean and why? Why since the time of John the Baptist? Because the devil knows God's law. He knew that the blood of the lamb was the first requirement to triumph over him. And he was freaked out. His anxiety was shooting through the roof. And that's part of the reason why Jesus had to be tested why he was led into the wilderness to be tested. Because you think like, well, why would God do that? Why would God lead him into the wilderness to be tested? Because he needed to make sure that Jesus was going to do what he sent him to do. And we have to be tested along the way in our own covenant in order to make sure that we are actually in this. Why was the devil motivated to test him? Because he wanted to try to throw him off course so that he would not fulfill the blood of the lamb, the first criteria to triumph over him. The second criteria is here. The witnesses are here. And you've seen many of the tests that I've gone through. I've shared them with you. I haven't shared all of them on the channel. A lot of them I share in Sabbath. But I've known since pretty early on that I was going to die for what God set me apart to do. As he was building me, he very clearly let me know that. And anyone who is close to me will tell you that I shared that with them, that I have known from the very beginning that I was going to die. I did not know from the very beginning what my role was. God had to teach it to me in scripture, but he started dropping little things on me. Like first he was testing me and the devil was testing me to see if I was going to be sturdy enough. God counts the costs before. He doesn't wait till afterwards. He checks to see if we're going to be sturdy enough or if we're going to run back down Mount Gilead in fear. And so he allowed the devil to test me. Are you going to be too afraid for your children? Are you going to be too afraid for yourself? Well, what if he does this? And what if that gets taken away from you? And I passed every test. By the grace and empowerment of God, I passed every test. I went through all of that, the horror of what he was showing me and how he was testing me. And then I would get to that point. God would build me to that point where I would say, I'm still going to do it. No matter what, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. More recently, there were some things that needed to come out of me, some options that happened early on. You know, when you have parents that do certain things that are unacceptable, those things become options. And so God allowed the devil to test me in order to burn that out of me. Nope. I'm not going to take that easy way out. No matter what, I'm going to believe. No matter what, I'm going to continue forward. No matter what, I'm going to trust you. We don't even know the things that are inside of us. I, I didn't even know that that was still there. But God knew. And he is going to burn these things out of us and test us along the way. It's not a one and done. And what has to happen is that we have to turn to God every single time. We have to recognize that we're being tested and we have to turn to God. So the devil is very threatened right now. He knows who I am. He knows he, ha he can't touch me. He knows who the witnesses are. He knows he can't touch them for 1260 days. On the 1261st day, then he will have permission to overpower and kill the witnesses, to imprison them for 10 days and then to kill them. But he also knows that it doesn't really matter that he's going to kill us because that work will have already been done. The second requirement is the testimony of the witnesses who did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They've known they were going to die. It's not their death that triumphs. 
It is their testimony. Jesus has already died. His blood is the first criteria. The second is the testimony of the two witnesses, the 144,000. So what does Satan know at this point? Well, at that point, he's been thrown out of heaven. He gets thrown out of heaven before he even kills the witnesses. In Revelation 9, you see that he is a star that is thrown out. He falls from the sky, is given the key to the shaft of the abyss, goes into the abyss, and when it opens, smoke comes out of the abyss. And then in Revelation 11, it says that when the beast rises from the abyss, he overpowers and he kills the witnesses. So he has already been thrown out of heaven before he kills the witnesses. It's not their death. It is the fact that they bore their testimony boldly, unafraid, unashamed, said the things, did the things that God requires them to do, regardless of the fact that people tell them they're using their anointing incorrectly, that people don't like the things that they have to say, that people fight against them, that they slander them, that they lie, that they join them and are insincere. Regardless of all those things, they continue forward doing what God has set them apart to do, what God has built them to do. And when Satan sees that he's been thrown out of the heavenly realms, he's angry and he knows that his time is short. And he goes off to wage war against the church during that reign of the Antichrist. So you see, he the plan isn't laid out to him. He doesn't know exactly how it's going to happen. We don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I mean, as God has revealed things to me, I've let you know. I had no idea he was going to blow all four trumpets in the first year. I think it was the first year or at least year and a half, but in, under a year and a half. I had no idea he was going to do that so quickly. I thought it might be spread out over the first three and a half years. But I kind of understand why he did it quickly. You know, he's separating the wheat from the tares. Now he is finishing things up before that fifth trumpet. And those who have a heart for him are doing the work. And those who don't are falling off. And that's exactly what we see happening in the body. You either want this or you don't. Like at this point... What I've experienced with God is that he's gotten a lot more stern and that that has been the attitude that he has filled me with is you either want this or you don't. You're going to be told the truth and you either want this or you don't. He has not allowed me to take friends for myself. I had been talking to someone who I really enjoy talking with and God corrected me and he let me know you are not allowed to take friends for yourself. You are not allowed to turn to anyone. You need to be filled with me. Not having hours long conversations. You address whatever it is that people want to address. You don't get to sit on the phone and you don't get to take friends for yourself because what happens is then you're not able to say the things that I tell you to say. You're not able to be used by me. You either need to make a decision about whether you want friends or you want to be my shepherd. You won't be able to shepherd correctly if this is what you're doing. It's hard. It's hard because no one understands what it is that he has me doing except for him. But this is how he needs it to be. And this is what he's let me know. You have to be filled by me all the time. You don't get to take friends for yourself. And you must remain in a position where you will be. Nothing is going to compromise your ability to shepherd correctly. I understand that's consistent. Did any of the prophets have a BFF? Nope. Did Jesus become chummy with any anyone? Nope. Because it compromises our ability to speak in a particular way and he says if you repent i will restore you that you may serve me if you utter worthy words not worthless words you will be my spokesman let this people turn to you you must not turn to them and we know that jesus did the same thing and we know that you know the people were calling for him and he was and that, that in the book of john it says he did not entrust himself to them because he knew their hearts he had to remain in the position that God placed him in. There's a very specific purpose that God has me enacting at this point in history. And even with my daughter, I, I feel God doing this with me now where, you know, we used to be on FaceTime and we would be cooking in the kitchen or doing our tasks and things like that. But we'd be on FaceTime and just kind of talking about different things and you know, it's almost like if I were, were there with her and the baby and being able to watch the baby and the cute little things that he's doing or just say hi to him while I'm cooking. But God's corrected me and he's corrected her. He's pulled her in 
and spoken with her and isolated her and she's not like her feelings aren't hurt about this and my feelings aren't hurt about it it was a little difficult when he first started doing it because we were used to being in contact but it's really important that we're isolated in him the majority of our lives are supposed to be spent being isolated in god it's so different from the way that we lived previously oh my goodness like you would have called me a social butterfly but really I, I just could not be isolated like that. That was a compulsion to keep me from being in God. So as you go along, you have to know that if you are not dealing with the unresolved suffering you've experienced in your life, that's going to become a chink in your armor. You have to know that if there's one area, that one part of you that you are not willing to address, that's going to become a chink in your armor one idol that you've placed before god it's like your your body's in everything's in the body except for that foot and the devil's going to grab your foot and he's going to pull you out because you let that be a chink in your armor and contrary to what counterfeit christianity says you must be occupied by the spirit all the time you've been made as a vessel as a temple you realize that a temple was established in order for people to understand God's spirit, where God's spirit was dwelling. Now, does God live in temples made by human hands? No. This was established in order to help you to understand what you are as a temple. So what are you going to do? Sometimes God's going to occupy you, and then where is he going to be the rest of the time? You throwing him out on the street, or what are you doing? You making a homeless God? I mean, because he's not going to have that, guys. You're a vessel. You're a temple. So you have to be occupied by him all the time, and you have to live by the spirit all the time. But in counterfeit Christianity, they say, well, you can't live by the Spirit all the time. Um, yes, you are actually designed for that. Oh, but we're sinners and God came for the sinners. Listen, that's not what the Word said. The Word says that he came to call the sinners to repentance. It is not an excuse to continue going on sinning. God calls sinners into repentance, but he only chooses the repentant. He is not going to choose people who deliberately go on sinning. In fact, the word says no sacrifice is left for those who deliberately go on sinning. So don't delude yourself. Don't excuse yourself because you don't even have the power or authority to excuse yourself. The only way you'll be justified is by God. So anything that you're saying now to justify you is so foolish. It makes no sense. We don't justify ourselves. You always got to choose God. You always got to choose truth. You have to be actively participating in your covenant. And the fruit of that is that you'll be carrying your cross. You'll know what your cross consists of. You will be moved on an upward trajectory in Christ, growing and activated in the purpose for which he has set you apart because each person in the body has a task and in order to enact that task, they're given gifts. And that, the proof is in the pudding, guys. That is the fruit of God choosing you. Him giving you gifts to enact the task for which he has set you apart. Please discern this with God.